Ati Ho. Uh, good afternoon there, Oscar Jalupski. Thank you so much today for joining me on the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. It's only a pleasure to be here. And uh, you're a long way away, and uh, we've got chilly Cape Town, but sunny. Yeah, well, we're having the mother of all storms here today in Brazil, and it literally has not stopped raining all night. And I was kind of like a little bit worried because I had to turn the, the internet off last night because I was like, we might get struck by lightning. And then this morning I turned it on at about like 5.30 when my daughter woke up and uh, and there was no signal. But, and I was like, oh, this is, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was so ready for this podcast. And then the internet wasn't working. I was like, no, <laughs> but um, I don't well, know. We, we've always got load shedding. So we know what to do. You know? So we always got backup. Yeah, you guys are super well prepared, but um, we we don't have that that problem here yet. But um, but yeah, I'm glad we managed to to get this off the ground so far. So, um, Oscar, I just finished uh, listening to your book, uh, No Retreat, No Surrender, and it's such a marvelous book. Um, you've lived such a adventurous and fulfilling life. Um, I I can imagine there was a lot of joy in like reminiscing your story and writing about it. Yeah, there was. I mean, like life. I mean, I think you, everybody experiences it. All your 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 customers, all the followers will experience it. You have ups and downs in life, and it happens to everybody. Don't think that I'm just the best thing out there because I've won 12 times. I've, I've also lost many times, but it's the whole thing is getting up and keep on going, you know. And you never. And, and again, life throws you curveballs, and it throws everybody, same as me. So, yes, I've had, I'd, I'd say, a very full life. I mean, it, they... Uh, on the 25th of November, 2019, I got that call, which everybody uh, doesn't want to get, but you get it. And it's like, hey, uh, Oscar, you've probably got six months. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, I burst out into cheers. I was in Portugal. And then I just said, well, gee, I'm 56. What I've done now in my, at 56 years old is probably done more than most people have done in three lifetimes. And that's the most important part of life is that you're going to live every day. Yeah, that's for sure. I can imagine that phone call kind of like sunk a few hearts in in your family. That's for sure. Um, but but your your attitude was and is like really phenomenal. So um, yeah, I just show everyone super glad that you that you have that strong mindset and will, and and you still have yeah, fighting a eh? like a machine. <laughs> so Oscar, um, something uh, which is really obvious is that you've clearly touched a, a lot of people in your life. Right. And, um, I was busy going through the Amazon reviews. Uh, they say for an author, you should never read your reviews. So I don't know if you've actually ventured there or not. Um, but, um, I read a review that I'd like to kind of almost, uh, read out to you because I think it's, it just sums things up super nicely, uh, for, for the rest of this conversation. Right. So this is from Nigel in Australia. Um, he says, I was at high school with Oscar in the 70s at Westville Durban Natal. I still remember the impact of seeing him for the first time, a dominant large bloke who looked like he would pulverize anyone in his way. I was not wrong from those first impressions. He was very competitive, but actually a gentle giant and someone I really got to enjoy and admire. I, he tended to polarize people around him. He was brash and competitive and was, was going to win. <laughs> he said, reading his book brought all of this together. His incredible accomplishments were totally ignored in terms of recognition by the school system that was focused on rugby and cricket. I know that spurred him on, as he tells in his story, but, th but that in so many ways is very sad to reflect on, but so incredible that he could elevate his levels of motivation to excel at everything he turned his hand to. I purchased this book because I knew Oscar, but now in sharing with so many interesting parts of his story with my friends, realize that this book is excellent, not only to anyone who enjoys Ironman and ski paddling competition, but to everyone looking for inspiration and an interesting read. It made me reflect on my younger days, and now I'm in awe of Oscar and his will to win, whether competing in sports or fighting cancer. That's quite an amazing review and just sums up everything so well. I was just wondering, do you do you remember Nigel at all by any chance? Yes, his name's Nigel Adams, and I think he moved to Australia. And I, I didn't know that he had uh, written the review, but uh, it's fantastic. And, and again, I mean, that's what life is. I mean, I think Nelson Mandela said, if you help other people, they'll help you. And, and I think that's what my whole life has been all the time. I mean, 
I am very competitive and I hate losing, but I'm always trying to help other people. Even my own competitors, my wife said, oh, you're crazy. Why do you give them so much information? You give them all your secrets. Well, I said, I can give them all the secrets. I'm still going to beat them. <laughs> That's classic. I was wondering, did, did Nigel know you as um, as fiberglass? Because that was one of your nicknames at school, wasn't it? Yeah. No, no, but no, before school was fiberglass. No, he knew me at, at high school. So he was in most, a lot of the same classes as me. And, uh, but I was my, my young years. I was fiberglass because I was always in the in making surskis and and making boats basically when I was a youngster. So that's that's where the no, name fiberglass came. And I probably was itchy all my life, you know, from all those fiberglass shards. Yeah, yeah, I laughed at that. Um, it was like when you were building the the sort of boats and kayaks with your with your dad and granddad. Um, it's amazing how that kind of like flowed through your life, you know. And now you have. You know, well, you've had like a couple of of um, companies that actually make the the kayaks, and um, you know, now you have a great one in Portugal, and it's just amazing how that influenced you so much. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the difference between me and any other famous sportsman. I'm not a famous sportsman, and not one day of my life could I just sit there and just go and paddle because there's never enough money. You know, so when you win a, a race in South Africa. Let's put it in perspective. You probably won win one bottle of wine. A big race is two bottles, you know, and it's probably improved a little bit. But you can't even feed a family on the winnings you get. So you have to always balance your life, and that's the secret of of my success. Is I balance my sport, business, family, and health all together. Because if you don't do that, you end up going down one route or the other route. So I had no option. I mean. As you saw, I nearly went to golf, but the bottom line is, is that you have to, and everybody has to balance their life so that you make everything work. So, because it's so easy to just go and paddle all day and leave your work and you're not going to have money. And it's so easy just to work all day and be fat and lazy and then never do any exercise. So that's something that I really have done all my life. Because for, as I say, I started, you see, when I was 14 years old, I'm still competing at 60. That's a long innings. And, and again, I'm not just competing just like, uh, in my age group, I'm trying to win all the time. Yeah, I mean, your book is is rather phenomenal. Like you know, talking about the the highs and the lows, and you know, you touched on it now. Like you know, there were so many times in your life where you were pretty much skint, you know, and uh, or you had done like really, really well um, business wise, and then you were thrown this sort of curveball, and um, you know, effectively having to kind of rent out your house and go live in, in somewhere that was cheaper so that you could make ends meet. And um, it was really fascinating actually hearing like almost how many times that had happened in your life. Yeah, I mean, that's something that people don't know. You know, they all think, I mean, it's, it's the strangest thing. Everybody in South Africa, most of the people know my name. So if I walk into a car dealer, they say, oh, Oscar, you must buy the 7 Series BMW, you know? And I say, no, no. I'm here for the second hand uh, 5,000 Rand uh, car. And they just can't understand it, you see. And that's the difference between people, the perception that you get. And that's the same perception. I mean, some some people say, oh, no, Oscar, he's brash and he's this and he's that, you see, until they know you. And that's, and, and funny enough, so many people say to me, in fact, Richard Mulholland uh, that you had on the podcast before said, the funny thing about Oscar is that no matter who you are, he'll find something good in you. And I think that's what we all should be doing. But we always find and we always criticize people. But there's always something good in somebody at any time. So even those companies that that uh, might have done me a disservice or anything, I never hold the grudges. It doesn't worry me. I just got to move on, learn from the mistakes and carry on. And that's what I try to do in the book with those life lessons. Yeah, it's interesting what you say there about like perspective because I asked a few mates and stuff. I was like, "Oh, have you heard of Oscar?" And they're like, "Oh, yeah, he's like the the doozy canoe guy. He he won the doozy all those times." And I, and then I, I like I like I hadn't finished your book then at that stage. So I was like, "Yeah, no, he's the doozy guy." I got to that part, but then I was like, "No, wait, actually, he didn't win it." But I mean, he was definitely the face of it for a long time in terms of how you helped re like re sort of um grow the um the sort of brand effectively. Um, but that, that no one even really knows about this other life of yours as this like international uh, surf ski champion. You know, it's uh, it's really weird that perception. Eh? It's crazy. Yeah, exactly, and that's what happens with most people. I mean, as I say, I got this uh, uh, way of assessing people. If people don't hurt me or harm me or anything, I can't say anything bad about them. How can I just hear what other people are like? Meeting people and seeing what they like and. I'll get on with them and I'll, if I don't get on, I'll find a way to get on with them. So 
And, and I think that's what everybody should be doing in life, except so many people pre sort of judge you and they don't even know you. And that's why, I mean, with the friends that you ask, they, yes, they always say, oh, yeah, the doozy thing. I said, yeah, but I was just doing doozies to promote the sport and, and made it big. And everybody thinks I'm the doozy champion. They forget about Hawaii and all the other things I did for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you touched on like how long your career had been. And um, I was just wondering, like maybe re-listening to what Nigel had wrote there, uh, what does it feel like to still have such a like a positive influence on on guys that you kind of went to school with, which is probably like forty five years ago? Exactly. Yeah, we. Uh, I finished in nineteen eighty, so it's forty three years to be exact. And and yes, I mean my life still to this day. I love teaching people. I like helping people. You know, and and some people take in the wrong way. You know, I mean it was interesting. I was paddling around Immerentia Dam on on Saturday morning. So you can imagine, I'm I'm pretty famous when it comes to my own sport canoeing, and I was panning around. I just and I was shouting in the, across the dam. It was a small little dam. I said, "Listen, guys, come! I'm doing a technique session." And it was amazing how many people didn't take up the offer, and they thought maybe he's joking. What is this? I mean, it's like Tiger Wood. Would, if you play golf, Tiger Wood says, "Listen, come for a free lesson," and you say, "No, no, I'm too busy. I'm I'm no better." And that's the problem with people. I mean, it just makes you so cross because there's an opportunity I could have coached twenty people and made twenty people better, but it's amazing how many people think they know everything. And 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 they think, oh no no, you know, I don't want to learn from Moscow. He, I, I've never beaten him. I've never come close to him. But I still, I don't think I can learn from him. So it's the strangest thing that you have out there. And, and people are like that. I, I, and it like astounded me. I said, Gee, I'm, that was one and a half hours of my time for you for nothing, and I'm just doing it. And you can join me. And and again, that's what happens to people. They they think they know more than they are. And, and I've always said this, I've had this old adage and then it's a, a normal one is that you're never too old to learn. And I'm very happy to learn from other people. And But it's strange how other people don't want to learn, you know, even if it's free. Yeah, no, it, it is very strange, but um, humans are humans are strange. That's for sure. We're these very complex yet simple creatures, but um, we have these very strange nuances. So anyways, they lost those people. Uh, but talking about um, talking about people, this is actually a question from Rich, and um, he said that you are uh, quite a polarizing guy, and there's uh, lots of people that don't actually like you. Um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I've, I found that so many people have prejudged you, and I don't care if they don't like me. They, it's a, it's, and, and in fact, there was, there's a video that I always use, that this guy, uh, Arvin Lawler says, oh, you know, if, when you meet Oscar, you think, what an arsehole. But after 10 or 15 min minutes, you become his friend. And then I, and I'm one of those people. I mean, I am what I am. I don't bullshit around. I don't beat around the bush. I, I say what I say and, and I mean what I say. And I'm, I'll always stand by my word and, I'll, and my word's my honor. And that's an important part. And again, I always find people, uh, good part of people. So I don't worry about they think I'm an arse. I'll just say, carry on. And then eventually they will change. And it happens all the time. But it's amazing how people prejudge you and say, oh, no, Oscar, gee, he's so full of himself and everything. But at the end of the day, it doesn't take long before they my mates. And and that's why I've got on my, my, on my iPhone, I've got 7,500 contacts with I keep in touch with people. I'm, I'm one of those people. It, it's hard work networking, but I keep my network. I can go anywhere in the world and I've got friends that will say, oh, come and, come and stay with me and do this. And that's why, because I, I make the effort. I mean, I was in... Uh, on the East Coast, I think I've, I met uh, 10 different people on 10 different days, every day, like every half an hour, trying to meet people and making a plan because it's so easy not to do it, you know. It's so it's much easier to say, oh, I can't make it. And I make an effort. My wife gets mad because like, cause now she is getting dragged around with me meeting all these people and saying, but exactly, that's what you're going to do because you're not there to make anything out of them. You're just trying to keep your relationship going that you've had for 20, 30 or 40 years and it takes effort and and. That's why people are so shocked when when you send me an email, you get a reply. I'm never, I, I don't care who it is. I'll always reply, email, WhatsApp, all the time. And then it frustrates me when I get people that just don't reply. You know, it's like, I mean, yes, yeah, say, listen, uh, say, uh, Oscar, I hate you. Don't send me any emails. They don't even reply. You know, it makes these, I mean, I'm all, all about being positive and, and helping people. That's my, my sort of my gift to society you know and trying to teach them how to be positive and how to teach them how to uh, face adversity and that's why i wrote my book i've never written my book and, and, and my old adage is in, in in adversity there's opportunity so 
you get six months to live. I said, okay, we're going to write a book. That's how it came about. Otherwise, never done it because I didn't see, feel the right because there's thousands of much better sportsmen than me out there. Although I always think I'm better than most. <laughs> well, but I mean, I'll I'll argue with that for sure. I think you're quite a phenomenal sportsman uh, just from reading your book. That's for sure. But what you were saying there, like, I think people often get confused with confidence and arrogance and like somebody like you, who's clearly like, you're a confident guy, right? That, that's what you are. But people are like, no, they just get confused because there is quite a, quite a fine line, you know? And, and maybe that's why there's that kind of like bit of like, oh, Oscar in the beginning. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think you have to be confident and, and it's just the way people, some people don't like confident people. In fact, you know, the total property syndrome, oh no, that guy is too confident. I don't really like that guy. And then you realize he's not just confident, he's just like a normal person, but he, he wants to be positive and, and the positivity leads to uh, confidence, which leads to arrogance. The way you look at it, not me, because I don't think I'm arrogant. I just think I'm just being positive and, and realist. Yeah, no, I totally get it. But I've been, um, I almost like have the same kind of issue sometimes in my life. Like people are like, yeah, I know Gareth, he's a bit, he's a bit arrogant, isn't he? But, <laughs> but it's actually not that at all. I'm just like, I'm like just a really confident, happy guy. And, and I think, I think that's kind of like almost not the norm these days. So, so that's why people kind of take it the wrong way. Uh, I was reading, I was reading your comments on, on social media and uh, it's so like awesome to see everybody's definitely like rooting for you you know and they're like come on Oscar and like like really really sort of just I don't know really engaged and uh, one of the things you touched on now um, is uh, networking and another thing that you speak about is sharing your story like why are those things so important to do? I think the the big thing and and, and my friend uh, Derek Watts just passed away and then Mark Pilgrim another friend of mine just passed away and I think you you've got this opportunity you have got a platform yes I've, i'm i'm not like a lance armstrong or uh, pierce morgan that's got millions of followers or trevor no i'm just like this small guy trying to help other people and the only way to help other people, even though i've got a twelve thousand people it's twelve thousand people that i can help because i know in my journey i'm going to have ups and downs but i'm going to help them to overcome it and my wife gets very upset because i get hundreds of emails to say, oh, I'm going through this. How can I do it? And again, I reply to everybody, which my wife said, oh, it doesn't pull you down. And then, and then I hear obviously lots of deaths of the people that I've been helping and they, they die. But I mean, how else are they going to know and, and, and live their life if they've got nobody to follow? Because one thing about my whole life is that I like to network and no matter where we are, you need support. And the support comes from your network, as you can see. And then, and I try, and it's very difficult to reply to every single person, say, hey, thank you very much, I'll keep trying. And, and, and it's important to do that. And, and it takes a lot of time and effort. And, and it's not easy. And people uh, still say, oh, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's your gain? I said, the end of the gain, if I can help one or two people out there, it's like when I was a life saver, I could save one or two people's lives. I think that's an important thing in life. And it's sort of, sort, sort of a feather in your cap if you do and help other people. And I, I think that's the only way. So that's why I made the story public. And I, I had a friend, uh, I won't mention his name. He kept it so secret that when he died, and I knew everything about it, when he died, people thought he died of COVID. Meantime, he had cancer all the time. And, and, and again, he didn't get the right treatment where he could have got the right treatment because everybody tries to help you. And then you've got to take out what you want from, from what the people are saying. And that's what I did. I, I mean, I increased my my uh, health insurance when and somebody told me, oh, you've got to do it for the end of the year. I made that by two days. And they said, oh, you must go and see this doctor. This guy is good. And then you make your decisions. But these people, a lot of people have been through the same as me. So they can help you. I mean, you you learn from experience. You don't just go there at your own. So, And I think that's where social media is very powerful. I and mean, that's why I try and use it and try and help people. I mean, and my wife even gets, oh, no, why are you posting again? Oh, that's a day. If I don't do this, who else is going to do it? So that's what, and, and again, there's so many people you just don't realize. I mean, I have lots of friends dying, but I have lots of people taking positive things. And that's why I wrote the book. And and, and I have so many people I just, that are suffering it and they give their, this book as, as a gift to try and make them more positive. Yeah. Well, I think it's an amazing book and uh, what you're doing is awesome. It, it just goes with kind of your kind of like almost ethos and spirits. It feels like just to, you know, just give a hundred percent damn it in everything you do. You know what I mean? So I, I really, really like that. Um, it's so interesting that you mentioned uh, Derek Watts. 
uh, because you know, I just noticed that the day that he died, like on, on Twitter, that his name was trending. So I clicked on it and yes, yeah, it was really emotional actually reading all the comments. He was one guy who touched everybody in a good way, you know, and you just, the, the only other person that I've read comments like that when they passed away was Robin Williams. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like they loved Derek Watts. So, you know, it's uh, it, it pays to be nice to people. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and, and he epitomizes that. And, 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 uh, and I tried my hardest to help him a lot. And, and I met Belinda, his wife at the memorial last week. And she always said, and he says, Oscar, you won't understand how Derek Watts looked up to you. And that was very nice and, and took your, everything I gave him, I try to help him as much as I can. And, and, and you, again, if it, if you didn't say that he had anything wrong with him, I couldn't have helped him, which makes me cross. And when I hear people committing suicide and I was speaking to him two weeks ago, why don't they just talk to me? I know I would have got them positive and got them out of it, you know, so I've had, I've had that, which is disappointing, but again, it just shows you, you could, you've got to communicate for all the people on the world. You just got to talk to somebody, just confined in somebody. So, you, cause if you're talking to people, that's when you release, all, all your, your emotions and your struggles. And, and as I say, that's something that I try and stress all the time. Talk about it. And a lot of people don't, by the way. Yeah, I know. People are kind of scared to to be vulnerable. Um, you know, I, I actually, my, my best mate committed suicide and I didn't know that he had tried to commit suicide twice before then as well. And I was like, jeepers, why? Like, like, why didn't you tell me, you know, like, I'm, I'm sure I could have at least maybe at least I would at least given a hundred percent to try and help you, you know, and then, but yeah, it's, I think that there's a bit of shame and, and that's for a lot of people and yeah, but it doesn't get you anywhere. That's for sure by not speaking about it. Um, so yeah. So Oscar, like, uh, sport teaches us a hell of a lot, right? Uh, you, you've had like this phenomenal career and it started when you were, were really young. You, I think it was at 14 or 15 years old, you won the uh, junior and senior surf lifesaving Ironman, like in consecutive days, no, no, on the same day, <laughs> which is with, with no rest, which is, which is pretty insane, uh, going, uh, but there was one story that kind of stood out for me in the book where, um, you said the, the main competitor in the senior race, it was Andy Sutherland. Um, he came up to you after the race and congratulated you and you were kind of like in awe of, of that sportsmanship and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what happened there and how you've kind of tried to emulate that. Yeah, you see, the interesting thing is that, that when you're so young, I mean, this is 14, 15 years old, you actually don't realize what you're doing. I mean, believe me, there's, you have a look at, around there. I mean, Boris Becker did well. I think he won Wimbledon at 15, which is unbelievable. And again, it's very hard and you don't actually understand. There's no rule book to say, hey, what do you do when you're the world's best at 15 years old? What are you supposed to say and everything? And and it was fantastic. This older guy, he's probably 15 years older than me, came up and, and congratulated me. And I thought, oh, what for? And I just thought this was a normal day for me, you know, just the one junior, you know. But it, again, that's what you need to learn from other people. I mean, and that's, you can only learn that if, they, if they're willing to give you the time. And, and that's why I try my hardest. Uh, doing the same as what Andy Sutherland, who was the champion at the time and he was winning everything. And then this young guy beats you and then he still had the humility to say, congratulations, well done. That was phenomenal. So that's what you want, you know? So you, so from those people that teach you when you're young, it, it's to this day, you, you, you can emulate, you can use what they taught you when you're young. And I think that's important for all youngsters to learn from the elders. I was wondering in the book, you didn't really mention a lot about mentors. Did you have any yourself? Yeah, that's an interesting thing because again, maybe I'm just, I was like so positive. I didn't really need anybody out there. Of course, they, I, I looked up to people and then I, I didn't hero worship. I wasn't like a mentor. Like my father is obviously a fantastic, phenomenal athlete and uh, it didn't take me long before I was beating him. So my goal, anybody that was a mentor, I would eventually say, oh, no, I'm going to beat you next week. And then I'm invariably trained hard enough to, to beat them. Like Tony Scott was sort of my mentor, how good he was. And, and then eventually at age in 1980, or, yeah, 1980, I managed to beat him. But I, I mean, I actually let him win like three or four days in a row in, in the PE to East London race. And then I realized, hey, he, he's, he's very much more competitive than I was. And I switched like that. And then in the last day I beat him. So the big thing is mentoring. 
I, I never had, I mean, say, I just like people that achieve out of the ordinary, like a Tiger Woods, a Michael Schumacher, and now uh, Max Verstappen, you name them all, uh, Michael Phelps. So those are the guys, they're not really mentors, but they just show you that what you can do. And, if, and I always say to everybody, I've got two arms, two legs. I've got the same as you. I've got the same opportunity. It's all in the mind. <laughs> I think you're underplaying a, a, a couple of things there, but to be totally honest with you, like uh, there's a bit of skill involved in some of these things and natural <laughs> natural ability and talent. So actually talking about that, I'm, I'm really amazed at people that can reinvent themselves. You know, you've done this both in sports um, and in life and business, <clears throat> but I just like to sort of talk about the sport parts, you know, You've, you know, you've obviously had a phenomenal career in um, uh, surf lifesaving, um, and but but do, like in school, you went from seventh team rugby to first team rugby. Uh, you went from a twenty four handicap golf to a, a scratch golfer. You you played um, water polo for South Africa. You bodyboarded for South Africa, and. I mean, it's quite remarkable how you, you managed to do that. Like, is there a secret? Like, how do you do these things? Well, I mean, I, I always talk about it in my talks. I mean, there is a secret. The secret is very simple. Is that so many people think, think I always ask this question. I ask you, what is the most important thing you need to build a house? And, and most people say foundations. But it's not. It's the plan. And if you don't write a plan down, you'll never achieve anything. So I start with a goal. That's the first thing in life you need. If you haven't got a goal, you won't achieve it. So from that goal, you have to make a plan. So I always just work back. I said, okay, this is how it's going to be. And if you've got a goal, and you, and, and the big thing about, and, and I've, I've read lots of books about this, is if you write down a goal, that goal is nearly 85% achievement. How simple is that? You're just going to write it down and you will achieve it because it's embellished in your head. The difference between when I set my goal I wrote them down and I told everybody. So if I failed, I looked like a complete turkey. So a perfect example, when I said I want to play, uh, I didn't say I want to play first team rugby. Now, I'm not playing rugby. I was playing seventh team or 10th team or no team. I said I was going to play in the toll school. They said, oh, you're crazy. You, haven't even you don't even play rugby. You're not even the first team. And again, so then I set about my goal. And 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 it was interesting that it was before the, the professional era. So I trained three times a day. A rugby player trained three times a week at those days. And that was that was it, even the, the international people. So I just took it to a next level. I just never saw failure uh, ever. So yes, and I had plenty of failures, but they just uh, always had an excuse why I failed. And then I just carried on and just went to the next thing. And, and, and I think that's very important that people should be much more versatile. There's so many people that are going down one road and, and, and then suddenly it gets taken away from you and you don't know where to go. I mean, I've got a friend now who was a, a, a play for England cricket. And he's like, always oh, messing. Oh, I'm, I'm going, to, I'm struggling now. I'm straight. I said, Hey, because again, they, they, you've got to keep every door open and you've got to think laterally and, and, and you know yourself better than anybody else. And it's up to you to find different ways of doing things, you know, because my whole thing in the Olympics, can you imagine? I went to the 1992 Olympics thing. I'm going to win a gold medal. I got beaten by miles and, but that day changed my life. It was an adversity, this opportunity. I said, okay, well, now I was coached by all these fancy uh, coaches around the world. And I said, no, no, this is not right. I'm going to do it my way. And my way is working out much better than anyone. Because I, I win races, not because I've got the strongest arms, it's because I've used my brains. And, and again, and that's in, in life and that's in business and everything. There's always a better way. If it wasn't uh, for, for us guys thinking out the box, There'd be no Microsoft, no Apple, no Elon Musk. They think out the box. And that's what we've got to do all the time. We've always got to do it. But we get sort of put in a box all the time. And we, get, we always get sent down the one route. You've got to look at different ways. And of course, you're going to fail. And failure, again, in adversity, you'll find uh, opportunities. And that's something that we've got to look for all the time. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think the other really cool thing about trying many things is it actually makes you an interesting person too. You know, like when, when you're old, you kind of like, you want to be interesting, you know, you want your grandkids or whoever it is, your old friends and stuff to go, yeah, I always like listening to Oscar because he had some great stories. He did so many things. I think doing lots of things is important. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, and again, it makes you obviously a better, more rounded person. You end up traveling around the world with different kind of people because the people that play golf are definitely not the people that paddle and the people that go to the Olympics are definitely not doing golf. And the people that start companies are definitely not the, the soccer players or the cricketers, you know, and you mix in. And the nice thing about sport, and I think that's very important, and that's just one aspect of life, is that you meet interesting people. And again, it's what you do with these interesting people that counts. And it's not you trying to get anything out of it, you can learn from people. And it's the same in business. You've always got to have these communities and the same with family. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of those people, obviously my wife gets mad. Oh, you always want to talk to people. So what? I'm just learning from it and and and, and meeting interesting people and again, telling their stories and not their only mine. I think secretly your, your, your wife, Claire, loves it. It's like she's, she, she'll go, no, Oscar, no, man. But she, deep down, she loves it because <laughs> it makes you that, a great That happens person. quite often. <laughs> so, 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 oh, see, do you have to go? I say, yes, we go. And then she's like, oh, I have such a nice time. Nice people to meet, you know. And, and, I, and I love meeting new people all the time. And, and, and the biggest difference is I keep on staying in touch. Like when I, when I give somebody a book, or somebody's bought my book, I'll pester them till I said, have you written a book yet? Excuse me, how far are you in the book? And I get so mad. And again, anybody, I say, because I just like to see their feedback and, and how I can improve and things like that. So I'm, I am like that. I'm very driven to, to do anything, as I say. Just, this is just not sport. It's just business, life, pleasure, fun. I'm, I want to be basically the best <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you gave me a little nudge on the book as well i was like i, I think i just bought it you like have you read it i was like no no i just got it <laughs> but um what i re- what i really liked in in the book is at the end of each chapter you you have these lessons and it's like a quick summary you know of, of things that you've learned in your life and literally geez people could just write down those one-liners and you can go you could take that away and you know like really change your life by just listening to those lessons i think they were really great kind of extractions from the book yeah, so when we did this book, the first thing I wasn't going to write a book. I mean, again, all, there's so many autobiographies of famous people that are got 15 or 20 million uh, followers. The whole aim for my book was to, to help people because it's much easier reading a book to say, oh, this is a mistake. Oh, I've also done that. Uh, let's not make the same mistake as Oscar made. And I think that's important. And and what I when I do my, my motivational speeches around the world, I always finish and say, listen, guys, I've motivated for 45 minutes, no matter how good I am, and I, I think I'm not bad, I'm going to keep you motivated for this hour, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, but there's no way you're going to stay motivated. That's why I said, listen, I've got 33 chapters in my book. If you read this uh, chapter a week, chapter a month, you'll keep motivated. And that's this book is about motivating. It's not about me. It's about the people reading this book that need to get motivated. And there's so many people out there that are struggling, and this is book there is to help them. Again, we all make mistakes and I make plenty and I put them in the book there. I didn't, didn't hide any, anything. I try to make it as real as possible and, and as life as, 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 as my life was exactly as, as it is. Yeah, no, that definitely comes across in the book. Talking about motivation, um, I had Corne Krich on the podcast recently and his actual uh, keynote is, is about debunking motivation uh, so I'm sure you probably mates with him. So you should you should maybe have a chat to him about that. No, actually, we're chatting and, and I'm still shooting on him every day. How far are you with my book? Come on, read your book. You want me to I send you an audio book? I, yeah, still hasn't read it. And I said, hey, come on, make time, you know. So like anybody, I, I really, I want him to read the book then, to give me feedback because this is a debunking bunking motivation. Yes, and I 100% agree. Some people go crazy when they get too motivated they actually go stupid which happens and i, I know people like that and and i think his his uh topic is great and i think people do need that because so many people are too motivated especially in rugby i'll never forget when i played my first the tell schools game i couldn't believe it the lock started hitting the wall he was trying to break the wall down with his head i said what the hell with me they used to say i used to have to warm up by myself because I didn't need but because I used to joke around, but when I was on the rugby field, then I was mean as anything. But I didn't need all that strange motivational stuff. And and I think that the uh, Cornet's thing is the way of uh, talking is, is the correct way because there are some people that go completely crazy, especially those those physical sports. Yeah, it makes me think back like when I used to play rugby in school as well. Like it was so ridiculous, you know, you'd you'd be like warming up and like trying to get so angry and stuff like to I don't know I don't even know why like I think back now I'm like 
it was so stupid <laughs> but uh it's probably like that was just what you learned from the other guys that were like more senior and it's kind of passed down to you and and you know you, you actually need someone you know like corne or yourself or whatever with a clear head to go listen oaks actually you you need to go out on the field with a, a clear mind of what you're going to do and um you can get the motivation exactly. uh, and and aggression out there you know what i mean um so so uh, just going back to your your story a bit, uh, your your mom sounded like a really phenomenal lady, and she was adored by by a lot of people and uh, or everyone. Uh, and she had this uh, her car; it was called the Chuck Wagon, which I think is such a cool name. And um, it was always filled with food um, for all the paddlers. And um, you also touched on like how, you know, after a day of paddling, like eating a, a loaf of bread with poloni was like the, you know, the, the serving of the day. And I was just thinking, yes, yeah, poloni was so good back in the day, wasn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And again, it just shows you and, and your parents guide you in the right way. And, and, and I think my mother is a epitome of that, is that she supported and looked after so many people. You never had to... I mean, we had so many people around at our house. They just come and they know they would get fed and everything. And again, we didn't come from huge means, but and this is something which is also very different from other how other people handle. There's my mother dying at my, when I was 18 years old, and yes, I shed a tear. But I said, well, she gave us a fantastic grounding, and I carried on. You know, so I don't don't mourn people. I mean, I will remember them, but I never mourn them. I just think, oh, I always like I'm talking now. I mean, it was a terrible thing to lose your mother at such a young age, but you've got to move on. Otherwise, it keeps you down. I mean, I don't, as I say, I, at, at, only now my sister is not much more uh, emotional than me. So I don't even know when she died. I knew she was only 42 and very young, and I was very young, but I, I moved on. I, I always try and move on no matter what I've done. And I think that's an important trait to learn. Because you have to learn it because it's difficult. I mean, you you, you you cut out of your heart. Your mother goes at that age and you, when you actually need them and you're around. But for me, I just moved on. And I think that's important for everybody to learn because nothing I can do is going to bring my mother back. So I'm, I'm, I don't know what the right word is. It's just like, okay, my mother gave me my ground. I'm so happy with her. I remember her as having the chuck wagon, feeding us. Always on my birthday, you can have you could choose your dessert, and she would cook it. You know, and it was something like that. But again, I mean, I, again, I've been with my wife forty years. I knew my mother eighteen years. In fact, probably sixteen years because for two years, when you went to zero to two, you probably don't remember anything anyway. So it's interesting, and so many people still dwell on the past. I like dwelling on the future and thinking only good of the past. I think you were definitely at the front of the queue when people were struck with the positivity stick uh, when they were born. So you have a, a quite a remarkable outlook on life, and um, you know, lots of people can definitely learn from that. Um, I just like to to touch and and hear a bit more about the the surf ski, um, which obviously you, you're phenomenal and world champion at 12 times. Um, there, there's one particular race in South Africa called the Texan. I think it's changed names now, but, um, but it's, I think it's the longest race there is. It's 250 kilometers, which for me just sounds pretty insane uh, from Port Elizabeth to, to East London. Um, I think you've won that race as well 10 times. Can you just talk a little bit more about that race? What is it? And well, it's from Paul is the East London. It's over four days, like a stage race, like the Tour de France. So the first day is from uh, PE to uh, Woody Cape, and, and that's about 79 kilometers. So, and in the old days, not now, is it used to go in any weather. So if the wind was blowing against you, it went against you. I never forget the one race. Um, the first day, Herman and I finished in eight hours, 15 minutes. We were the winning. Most of the guys finished in 13 hours. 13 hours and then I'd get in the morning four o'clock in the morning first light and off you went again so it's a seriously tough race and and uh, my first time I did it when I was about 16 or 17 with my father and my father was holding back and it was funny that then the last day he eventually said okay well let's go because they always said oh why are you planning for sun he's too young to be doing this and then we won the last day and in hindsight if we had gone earlier we would have won Anyway, and then the, the next time I came back to race against Tony Scott, who I mentioned before, who was a phenomenal paddler, one of the probably the best at the time. And again, I sort of had him in awe, you know, this is guy is so good. And and I raced and then the first day he beat me like a minute and a half, the second day. And I always we were racing neck and neck, and I was like chatting to him, and then he would suddenly just pull ahead. I think, gee, 
why do you do that? I'm his friend. In fact, <laughs> I, I could be his son. That's how young. So it was funny that I, that carried on. And by, th- by, the th- by the third day, he was nearly nine minutes ahead because he just sneaked over one or two minutes. And, and, and I wasn't even like concentrating. It came and it didn't worry me. And then the last day, he upset me. And it was like I was so cross that I raced on. And in and, and the 23 hours, I managed to catch up the nine minutes and beat him by one and a half minutes over 23 hours. So it just shows you how your 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 mental side because understand I was being beaten all the time. So how do I suddenly get so much better? So I beat him in nine minutes in one day. So it just shows you, and that's what I always try and stress to people. It's more mental than anything because there's no way you get fit in three days and suddenly I'm made um, that nine minutes faster. But my brain was nine minutes faster, and that's the most important thing you need. And and, and that's the same thing with the part of cancer. They say. Uh, the brain is the one that's going to keep you alive, not your body. So I'll that's what you... happens in that race. is really tough. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. I, was, I wonder, have you ever been in like a, like has the weather ever turned like for a like crazy storm or anything like that in any of your races where you th- like, whoa, well, this, I need to get out or something? No, no, never ever because you always there's always a race and when there's a race, it doesn't matter what conditions are, you're going to do it, you know. So like that year when we, when we went like crazy for for eight and a half hours, that was really tough. But you knew that was it. You had to go. So you just put your mind to it and, and that's the most important. I think uh, no weather, no anything is going to uh, change your mindset if you've got the right mindset. You know, sometimes you think, oh, eight and a half hours, but my longest paddle is two hours. I want to do eight and a half hours. How you do it is if you've got a mental state that's going to say, yes, I'm going to do this eight and a half hours or whatever it takes me to win this race or to be in the front, whatever. So you have to have that mental mindset. If you, if a chink in your brain, that's it. You will never finish when adversity strikes. And and that's what a lot of people have got when, when hardship starts in business and finance. I mean, look at it. As I say, you read my book, I had no money. My, my daughter couldn't go to school. I didn't worry me one bit. I said, oh, so, so what? I said, Hannah, don't go to school. And when you go to school, tell them that your father's got no money. And I'll say, no, I can't say that, Dad. You know? But I mean, that's what you've got to do. You've got to be a realist. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm never not going to pay anybody uh, their money. And I do. So the bottom line is I did. And she went back to school after three days, but it never worried me. You know, so that's another thing that's very different from me and anybody else. Nothing worries me. In fact, I've I've got this old adage where I tell people: I said, go into your toilet, lock the door, sit in that toilet, and worry like crazy, and see if you change anything in the world or anything in your life. And then that, oh, that's what happens because there shouldn't be a word called worry, and I haven't got that in my in my DNA at all. <laughs> I love that. That's a great thing. I think I actually heard you say that on on another, and I was like, "Yeah, that's so true, isn't it?" You know, because those worries are still there on the in the bathroom. <laughs> oh, it's classic. Um, I uh, you you touched on on uh, Tony Scott there, and um, you you one of your lessons uh from that actual race, or at least that chapter, is like respect people, but don't idolize them because you will kind of live in their shadow. And I thought that was really kind of like an important lesson for people. Yeah. I mean, and that happens to so many people. I mean, whether it's in business saying, oh, this guy's done so well and you like to idolize them and then you never actually challenge them. And and that's important because you've got to challenge yourself to be better than them or learn from them and use them as a stepping stone to get up higher. I mean, they, that's that old adage is, is that, the opposition actually makes you stronger. And that's where my brother came along. I mean, my brother was a phenomenal athlete, probably a better athlete than me because he was like built better. You know, he, he, I was much bigger, so I could play rugby. There's no way he could play rugby, but he was leaner and meaner and he was a real competitor. And again, that's what happens. You've got to look at your competition as helping you. But so many people look at his competition and say, oh, no, this is not helping me. And then let me tell you, our, my hardest training sessions was against him and my brother, who was a phenomenal athlete. But, and he made me a, even a better athlete. You know, So that's what you need in life. You've always got to have this opposition, no matter what you're doing, to make you a better person. And, and that's what uh, life's about, whether it's in business, family, anything. You've got to keep having somebody challenging you to make you better 
I really liked reading about that uh, rivalry that you guys had. It, it sounded it sounded really cool. And um, I was wondering, you, you're talking now a lot about like mindsets and, and and having a strong mind and everything is kind of mental. David Goggins talks a lot about like, you know, callousing the mind. Uh, have you got any maybe, I don't know, like advice for people? How do you, like, how do you create a strong mindset? Yeah, I mean, that, that's everybody wants that million dollar answer, you know, because this is the, the, the different thing is that, and the thing that I say is that, you can train yourself because I can assure you, I wasn't born with a positive mindset. You grow it yourself. And remember, the only way you can improve is learn more, okay? teach yourself more, learn from other people. That's the only way. You don't become a motivational speaker when you're born. You don't become a doctor when you're born. You decide what you're going to do and you've got to actually read the books, learn about it. And I always say is that the reason why I was a little bit better than anybody, because I did like 1% more every day than everybody else. And then I've got 360% more than everybody at the end of the year. So understand, you just got to keep on building slowly. So don't expect miracles overnight. You've got to do it slowly, but you've got to educate it. I think education is one of the most important things to make you cleverer because my other saying is, listen, none of us, not one of us are getting younger, but we should all be getting smarter, but we don't use it. We should be all getting smarter. How does a 50, at, when I won in Brazil, how does a 58 year old beat a 28 year old? I can't even do one pull up. You understand? So it just shows you that you've got to use your brain. It's the same. How come these uh, Warren Buffett at, at uh, what is he, 89, is one of the richest men in the world and he's still clever and he's getting cleverer? I mean, and that's, that's an important thing to note in life is that there's one thing that you can do better is educate yourself and get cleverer. There's never a way of getting younger. Mm, I like that a lot. If people remain like curious, that'll kind of help them get smarter as well. So I think it's it's always such an important thing. Just be curious about a lot of things. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions because there's definitely somebody who wants to know exactly what you are. But I think people are like almost scared to be like, oh, I don't want them to think I don't know this. You know, it's, it's just such, <laughs> once again, humans are, are kind of weird. Um so Oscar, you've done a lot of uh, traveling in your life, like all around the world. And, uh, you know, you've um, slept on your fair share of uh, floors and um, shared uh, people's uh, houses, um, um, shared hotel rooms and, uh, and, and many other things like that. Uh, but there's one story that actually Rich asked me to, to mention. He said, there was a, it was a moment when you got on an airplane and you were told that uh, someone had died on the plane and that you had to... Uh, it had to get turned around and uh he was like well maybe you could tell that story because it's a pretty cool story <laughs> <laughs> well i mean funny enough it's called lost in translation my um the maid uh, our housekeeper this is going back in the 98 just just before I, just when i met claire and her mother and and she phoned me and saying listen uh this lady's dad. I understood it. The lady died. So I just told the plane, oh, listen, I've got a problem. I have to get off the plane. And again, if you ask, if you don't ask, you never get. So they stopped the plane. I got off and then found out it was a, it was a wrong translation that she, she, she left her soap behind or something like that. <laughs> but <that's, laughs> it was so pathetic because, but it shows you it was lost in translation. But if you, where there's a will and that's, I'm very, where there's a will, there's a way you can do it. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been told Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. And I said, no way. I said, I can do it. Has it been done before? Yes. Oh, well, that's even easier. It's been done before. And I think that's a mistake. So many people that can't, you, that word can't comes in a, a lot of times to a lot of people. Even like now with my book, I'm saying, I want to sell a million books. And they said, but you can't do that. Nobody does that anymore because it's a changed market. I said, don't worry. I'm going to sell a million books. I said, if David Goggins can sell it, I can show you I can sell it. Oh no, but it's tough and all this. I said, don't worry, that's my goal. I, so my first goal is to sell a hundred. Then I said, I'm gonna buy myself a month long, because as you know, when you write books, the book sells in South Africa for three hundred and twenty rand. I make twelve rand, so you have to sell a lot of books to make any money. But the most important thing is getting the, my, my 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 message out there. That's the most important thing. But I still set myself goals. I said I want a hundred, and then once I've done a hundred, I want to get to the million. And and and. I know of ways of doing it, and I just keep on plugging the people who can't believe it. Why are you doing this? I mean, I've sold now 10,000 books, which is not bad because I spoke to the publisher. But again, it's always you can't. 
That's the first word I get from everyone. No, no, this is a different market. Different. I said, hey, if somebody else done it, why can't I? And that's what I do in life. And I think, and that's why where does the world is away? So you can stop airplanes. You can do whatever you like to uh, sort the situation out. It's amazing how people try and put their own almost like insecurities or lack of self belief onto onto other people. You know, like by like saying no, you can't. For example. So it's also interesting how people do that. No, they always do that. I mean, and that's and because it's much easier to go with the sheep than stick out. You know, that everybody follows everybody. And, and that's that's what happened when I started coaching differently my padding technique. It was no, no, that's because there's the and now thirty years has taken. That's how stupid it is. I always say, How stupid can you be? Oscar told you this thirty years and you're only lo- learning it now and saying, Oh, this is starting to make sense. I mean, that's how, how people become follow each other and they think they're going to get a different they're going to do the same thing every year and they think they're going to get a different result it just like frustrates me so much when i i'm there to teach them and there to show them i mean and i and i show them i say listen not only is my technique better but i'm at 60 i'm beating 90 percent of the field so maybe 10 percent doesn't doesn't need to be uh with me but even that 10 percent, they're all probably 40 years younger than me and i'm beating them so it's like and I'm always astounded to think that when I teach, I'm teaching this to help them. And they think, no, no, Oscar, there must be a catch. Like just, um, I guess, moving on from there, right? Uh, you've competed at um, a time in South Africa when, when there was apartheid, right? Where, um, you know, we effectively banned from everything. However, you were actually able to compete internationally, like, you know, for, for some of it or parts of it. Um, until like almost every door got shut in your face. Um, but one place that sort of kept it open a little bit longer was was the Molokai in, in Hawaii, uh, that race. And I mean, you've won it 12 times and it's uh, it just sounds like an, an insane race. I've watched some of your videos on YouTube as well, just just um, showing us the kind of the course and, and some of the races. Um, can you just maybe talk a little bit about that race? Like, what does it involve and like how treacherous is it? Well, that, that Molokai started again, and this is a life lesson, is that when I won that junior senior Ironman, another guy in Australia, one month later, won a junior senior Ironman. He wasn't actually South African TV. And from that day, I hated this guy and never met him. And because of apartheid, we couldn't compete. They were trying to fly him out and I was trying to go there, no chance. And in 1983, in April, they said he's coming to an Ironman in uh, Hawaii. And lo and behold, he didn't arrive. To cut a long story short, I had to stay there, make a decision to stay in Hawaii and, and give up on my rugby bursary and my BCom CA that I was studying. I went to Hawaii, and I stayed in Hawaii and, and I trained like crazy, which you have to do. You have to make sacrifice to win anything. And I beat him for about, by about 10 or 12 minutes. And he beat his, and he had all the excuses like anybody. And he said, no, he wasn't training hard, although he beat his, his record by 12 minutes. I happened to beat it by I beat the record by like 20 minutes. And from that day, so I won seven in a row then, and then I got banned. And then I, as I said, I went to, then I went to golf. And then 1991, Nelson Mandela was released and then I could compete again. So then I won a few races along the way. And, and uh, eventually in 2012, I decided to go back. So to put you, put you, uh, give you a, a visual of it, it's between the island of Molokai and Oahu, which is Molokai is a leper colony. And it's uh, 52 kilometers from Oahu. Oahu is where Tom Selleck hangs around, where Waikiki is, Honolulu is, all those lovely places. Basically, it's a downwind run. It's called the Channel of Bones. And it's the the most treacherous channel crossing in the world, they say. And the wind goes up to 30, 40 knots, and the swells go to 20, 30 foot. And it's very treacherous. So you go downwind and then you turn the corner for the last two kilometers, getting back into the into the wind and finishing in, in Hawaii Kai. So it's a very treacherous race. So and I'd won this race and I, and I, I won and lost, but I, I won my first one at age twenty, and at age forty nine I decided to go back, and that's where it puts you in a different league. So at age forty nine, where everybody's over the hill, so everybody's talking about Djokovic is thirty seven and Federer is thirty eight. Understand, I'm 49 and and uh, and racing against the best in the world. I mean, funny enough, in 2012, Clint Robinson, the guy that won the Olympic gold in Barcelona, was going for a three-peat. He'd won a two in a row and he's going for the third one. 
And 2012 at age 49, okay, and you have to make sacrifices and that's something you have to do in life. And I think that's, I don't mention that enough, is that how much sacrifices you have to make to be the best in the world and to, to change your lifestyle. I mean, and my lifestyle has never been a pro, so I have to like change lifestyle just before Molokai, lose 25 kilograms, don't drink in March, and off I go, race this race, I take off, I've not done it many times, obviously. I'm 49 and obviously the fast guys just, Blow, blow away and they all way ahead of me at a halfway I'm out eight and I slowly catch everybody up so it was very interesting catching everybody and then eventually uh, everybody's got an escort boat because it's so rough you know it's not like the comrades marathon or a marathon run you don't you can't just stop you have to carry everything and you need an escort boat because if you fall out or something happens they can uh, then then make you sure that you, you don't die because otherwise you'll you will die if you if you're not found you will definitely die in those, those oceans. So I eventually coming in and I asked my escort boat, uh, where am I coming? And they said, no, no, Dean Gardner, who's won it nine times in a row, is just in front of you there. And once you overtake him, you're in the lead. I said, oh, sure, that's an amazing thing. But I kept on asking, I knew Clint Robinson. I said, where's Clint Robinson? Because you can't see. I mean, because the waves are going up and down like this, you can't see. So I said, where's Clint Robinson? He's the most important, he's fast. Because when you turn the corner, once you turn the corner, it's a headwind. And he's an Olympic gold medalist. And Dean Gardner is very good downwind, but he's not good on the flat water. Where I was at the Olympics, not bad on flat water. So I turned the corner and Hawaii Kai, China Wall, surfed the waves, actually hit my rudder and carried on going. And then I was halfway of the two kilometers into this headwind. And you are completely spent. I mean, it's three hours, 23 minutes, 20 minutes. You are spent. You've, de- you've got nothing left at this stage. And then the escort boats were shouting, the people on the banks were shouting. I said, what are they shouting about? Dean God is never going to catch me on flat water. And then I looked back and guess what? They were shouting because Clint Robinson was coming. There was a guy 10 or 12 years younger than me who could do a thousand pull-ups. I can't even do one. And he was coming at me. But again, that's where your mental toughness came. I'd, I'd, again, I'd really shortened my paddle and off I went. And I won my 12th by 14 seconds from Clint Robinson, who smashed me in 1992 Olympics. And that's, and, and again, I was unlike all the other people and I was watching tennis out of there, they go raving and then we, they just didn't put it up. I'd crossed that finishing line, I'd even raise my hand, I stopped my watch and then I could hardly breathe. In fact, if I'd fallen off I, the ski, I know I would have drowned because I was hyperventilating. That's how far you can push your body. And you can see that I'd used my brain and, and, and managed to win my 12th one. So that was very special, but it just shows you how far you can push your body. And I think that also helped me in my fight for, uh, against this cancer that I've got. Yeah, that's a, that sounds like quite, a, quite an awesome race to be a part of. Um, I, can, I, I almost feel like it's hard for people to grasp how dis- difficult it is. What what you're doing uh, with with the sort of kayaking, like it's, I mean, even just balancing, you know, on, on flat water <laughs> is difficult enough. But never mind in the sea with thirty foot waves. Like I really think it's a, a super tough sport that people don't even have a clue how difficult it is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that with SCP sort of got more people on the water, which is great. But uh, SCP is this wide like as wide as my hands, some of them, and it's like sitting on a on a bathtub or sitting on a boat because it's so big, where ours is as wide as our hips. That's exactly how wide our boats are. And so they're very unstable. So there's a skill of balance, and then you have to put the power in to catch all these waves. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a tough sport. It's growing. It's a nice sport to have because you can do it anywhere, anytime, in any conditions, in rivers and lakes and things. It's a fun sport. So... Yeah, people don't, that's why I always, when I'm doing my, my talks, I always make sure I show a video of what it's like. And then they say, wow, this is tough because you see people falling off all the time. And, and I think that's important, but it's a it's a great sport. It's a sport thing you do for the rest of your life. And my father's turning 86 now, and he's still paddling five, six times a week. So it's a sport you can do for life. Oh, that's so cool. I, I didn't realize your dad was still doing it. So do you, do you guys ever go out together still? Oh, yeah. I mean, I still have to try and coach him because, again, he, sometimes you get over this curve, you keep on learning, and then you realize they don't learn. It's hard to change the bad habits that he's had for 60 years, you know. So, trying to change those. So, I'm always coaching him and helping him. Yeah, we go out lots of time, paddle doubles with him, teach him. Yeah. So, he's out there all the time. He's very sharp and he basically trades two or three times a day at 86. What? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um... 
So uh, South Africa is really well known for the doozy canoe marathon. And, um, you know, it's uh, it, it really is kind of like a highlight of, of the sporting calendar in South Africa. One of the things that you did with the doozy was really help kind of like uh, grow it again um, in terms of you partnered up with uh, celebrities um, in South Africa. And one thing that really like, it actually brought a tear to my eye, like of joy, you know, like, and, and I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, that, that you you helped kind of with the integration of the race with the kind of local community. Can you maybe just talk about some of those moments where they came and supported you and your partners? Yeah, it was interesting. So the first guy I had was Nas Porter, he was a Springbok uh, flower, and he was right in his prime. So he wasn't like over the hill yet. And he was a broadcast and he said, okay, the only way we do to get the sport well known is to get publicity in not the, the kayaking media, but national media. And, that started and then i said okay that's the start but the the blacks in the valley in the in the Mgeni valley they don't know nice water they don't play rugby they play soccer and they know all about soccer so the next person we said who's the next most famous place person and was clive barker who just won the african nation cup and qualified us for the Olympics and got to the quarterfinals in the olympics and i said let's get him and he was a fantastic character and then that's the first time we realized that how much uh, uh, publicity and how, much, how famous Clive Barker was amongst the people, the locals. So when we got into the first portage, so you paddle and you know, the Buduzi is running with your boat in the shoulder, I said, oh, I hate that. And at the first portage, there were like 10 kids coming to see Clive Barker. I said, hey, Clive, tell them to carry our boat. And from that day on, Every single time, and Clive was already old, so he couldn't walk or run very fast, but he paddled like a, like a master. And we had these kids there carrying our boat on every single portage. The next guy I did was the next biggest person, and in fact, the biggest person at the time, Dr. Kamala, was the Kaiser Chiefs main player, and he was in the, in the same team of Clive Barker. And the crowds came in their droves. So much so that, and, and I carried on doing it, and I want to go, uh, stress that so much so that in the current doozy races, in the current doozy race, because we attracted so many of these local people, in the current, out of the first 170 are from within the valley are previously disadvantaged paddlers. How's that? And in a sport that's expensive, where they haven't done it in swimming, they haven't done it in any other sport, except like the rugby and the cricket, where they were forced to, but in our sport, We've integrated and they love the sport. And because we bought the Dr. Kamala and then Peggy Sue Kamala and then baby Jake Matata, the boxing man. So all these people, uh, Sibu Sisuvalani, the guy who climbed Mount Everest, he, he up battled with them. Unati Africa, she was uh, an idol's judge and, and a singer and a, and a radio broadcaster. It just brought the people there. I mean, it was amazing to see suddenly crowds because the doozy, as a white person going through these black towns, you never hardly saw a single person. Now, when we, where I did it, the throngs, they even gave the kids off school to come down and watch. It was, a, it was incredible. So, so with them watching and seeing it, that made them want to do it. And that's what you'd have to do in life. And we, we thought out the box and we changed the whole sport of canoeing through that. Yeah, that's what I really loved. You know, it was just like such a hopeful and joyful story. And, um, yeah, just just changing. Like I think you even said, like the top ten finishers, you know, were all kind of like um, black. I don't know, they were all South Africans, but like you know, like that's, no, all that's, that's phenomenal. You know what I mean? Like in in canoeing, it's just almost the last thing you yeah. would kind of expect. So, um, yeah, well done for that. Um, the race has definitely got a, a lot to thank you for. Um, one one thing that stands out for me in your book is, is your integrity as like a person and kind of your, your transparency. Uh, you, you spoke, uh, you, you wrote about, uh, being like an insurance broker at one stage and then like kind of querying, like, actually, how do these fees work? You know, it doesn't really seem fair. Like I'm kind of overcharging the clients and they're not necessarily getting the deal that they, they're supposed to be getting. So, you know, I think in one of your first deals, you decided to kind of restructure it and give yourself less commission and inform the clients what was going on. And you almost took on the industry because you're like, no, we need to change this. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think life's about this. I mean, so many people, there's a, the difference between a con man and a salesman. The con man 
does it to make him rich. The salesman makes it for the client to be rich, you know, or, or definitely benefit from what you're selling. And 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 my first thing happened to be Lee McGregor, one of my arch rivals through the through the years and Iron Man and things like that. And the term of the policy. So if you do a ten year term, you get paid let's say three hundred dollars. A, a, a twenty year, you get six hundred, and, and a thirty year, you get nine hundred or fifteen hundred dollars. So so everybody in that industry before I got there were always making you the long term, so they get the biggest commission, the same amount of work. Whether it takes fifteen minutes to sign up a client and you make one thousand five hundred dollars, but if you gave them the right, and then after three years, the guy paid one thousand five hundred dollars comes to see how much money he's put in and he's paying three hundred dollars a month he's got nothing after three years and i say hey this is not good so that's why i changed it so i started uh, actually telling people how much commission each policy was getting and i was sort of hey you can't do that no they need this i said there's no way i'm going to do it and that's uh again it's an old story think out the box do it differently and and i was the master of a thing called pps or the professional problem society where you got no commission but you built up a, a database of people that trusted you. And that's what you need in life. I mean, I always say, look after your sales, look after your, your clients and they'll look, look after you. And that's what happened in life. And that's what happens in life still is, to this day is that if you look after them, they'll look after you in the long run. And that's what I've always done in everything I do, you know? So, and again, to a point of too much loyalty, actually, cost me a lot of money uh, along the way, you know, I mean, much a rich, ma much richer man than I am today. If I'd been uh, like a lot of hoods out there, you know, I, I was always looking after, I was always too loyal and then always too helping of other people. Yeah. Sometimes it can, it can bite you a little bit, but actually in the long run, it's, it's the right, the right game to play, I think. And, and I like what you also said in the book, like trust is priceless. And I think, Wow, if you if you think of, I don't know, one of the most important traits of a human being, it's like it has to be trust, you know, because those are the people that you're going to go to, or those are, if people trust you, they're going to come to you and believe in you, and you know, want your opinion and these things. And I think that's an, that's a really important thing to build, um, for all of us. Um, so we we we've, we've touched on it a little bit, like how you know how many times you kind of you know in business, um, you kind of almost had to pivot. Um, because I don't know, things didn't go well, um, or cash started getting tight. Um, and then you kind of had to downsize and stuff like that. And I was just thinking of your wife, uh, Claire, like, um, she must be such a rock star, like, you know, having to, <laughs> having to go, okay, Oscar, no worries. Yeah. Let's go, let's go rent a house and, and move out of this nice place we have. And, you know, that happened like quite a few times. I think she, she must be quite a phenomenal lady to to almost have to do that all the time or well, not you know what i mean like quite a few times in their life yeah i mean we've been together 40 years and again you have your ups and downs like in anything and anything you do you have your ups and downs but the one thing she trusted me and i think that's what you could have the trust and, and the loyalty and she's had to endure a lot i mean so when i was traveling around the world there i was away and she had to look after the kids and some of the parents at, at, at the school were saying has, has has hannah and luke got any has, has hannah and luke got a father we never see him but i was there trying to make ends meet and and the biggest thing is she had a blind faith to say realize that everything will turn out and it's getting better and better and better it's funny that getting i'm 60 and it's just getting better and better and better because slowly things as I say the wheel turns but sure for me it's been turning very slowly and now it's getting there and and she's enjoying the the fruits of all the the, the time that we were apart you know and I, I think that's important to realize that you're going to go through these phases in life where you're going to be that you should be with your kids and then you need to work to to put them through school and these things and you just got to get that balance right and I think we've got that balance right where it's your okay I, I, i'm going to make the money so that we don't the kids are getting older so i won't be there at every single match but i'll make sure we provide they go to the best schools and the best universities which i did so you have to make sacrifices uh for yourself to help them you know and i think that's and she's been there the whole time i mean and the hardest thing obviously is when when your partner when your when your husband's got cancer then it's even harder because they i think the people the support crew and the people around you take more strain than me so and, and i think that's something also that you've got to be aware of is that they they living your life 
exactly the same as you are, except that you're in control and they've got no control. They always ask me, she's always asking, are you sure you've got no pain? I said, no, I've got no pain. You're just saying that. And I said, no, I've got no pain. Don't worry. And she's always fishing and she's like, oh, you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that where I like to do everything. She does put a, a, a handbrake, tries to put a handbrake in, but she's struggling. The handbrake uh, cord is very stretched. <laughs> I can imagine you, you're a hard man to sort of uh, tie down, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, you, you've just, uh, you've spoken a couple of times now about um, about your cancer. So uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about that story? Like what happened? I think it was you were out in Australia, wasn't it? You were doing a race around the rottenness when you, when you kind of got diagnosed or, or had the pain initially? Yeah, I, had, I mean, I had unbelievable pain. And that's the thing with sportsmen. They can endure a lot more pain than most people. So I had this terrible pain and I thought, shit, and, and nothing would work. Funny enough that in, on the Emirates flight back, the, this is a good uh, method of, of curing pain without pills because I hate taking pills anyway. None of them worked. She put a, a hot water bottle uh, in a two liter, plastic two liter, boiling hot water and put those socks over and then I just put it on my back and it just eased the pain. In fact, if you ever have, and I spoke to a pain guy who said that's the best way is to have high intensity heat on your pain and it will disappear. So it disappeared. So when I came back to Portugal, I think about the 23rd of November, um, I went for another MRI because they did the MRI and that's what made this wrong. And, and they did the low part of the back. So then when they did higher up, they found the tumor pushing on my spine. And that's how they said, and they all, the reason why they gave you six months, they said, this is a secondary secondary cancer so we got to find the primary cancer and then came back to Crudisca just up the road yeah where Chris Barnard had his first heart transplant and they said no no and and just before I was getting operated on they said okay we found what you got you got multiple myeloma bone marrow cancer and it's an incurable disease but I still didn't know and I never was and I was still positive saying okay when can I start paddling but it was a six-month journey through COVID of having chemo every day. And I was very different to most people in chemo. They all said, you're going to get sick and you're going to be bad and this and that. And I said, okay, well, the only way I'm going to get sick if I've got food in my stomach. So I used to first three or four days before the chemo, have the chemo, have no effect, have my meal after the chemo and carry on training, doing everything as normal. Had the stem cell harvest, had the bone marrow transplant. And after that, I was, I was three weeks in hospital. After that, I could only walk 200 meters. And then because, and then I just slowly again grown. I mean, so I learned just like I went from golf to paddling to Olympics, the same thing. I couldn't play golf, couldn't paddle. So I walked. So you've got to just change your, your, your life. So I just walked and walked and walked. And eventually was doing 15, 16 kilometers of walk, walking and then eventually got back into golf and paddling. But along the way, because I had so much chemo, then I started getting skin cancer. And you can see that they chopped a bit of my ear and I got a big hole in my head those things just go with the territory. Again, most people say, oh, you've got another cancer and they would get upset. At no stage did they get upset. I said, okay, we've just got to fight and we've got to be careful. So cancer teaches that you, you've got to live every day, but don't be stupid about it and cut out carbs and do that. I've done all that. And at the string that I, I had permanent, I've always on permanent chemo. So I have chemo every three months. And then, as I say, I went to Australia, I went to Brazil. I had chemo and I went, flew to Brazil and I won that race at age 58. And four weeks ago, I, I met my Portuguese doc. He said, uh, Oscar, you're doing so well. Your, your multiple myeloma, your, your bone marrow cancer levels are so low, we're going to take you off. But then I went three weeks ago to breakfast, coffee, with my doctor mate, and he said, oh, I said, I've got such a pain in my back after the Molokai. I said, I wonder what it is. He said, I'll oh, come in for an MRA. He's a mate, you know, that's what you can do in South Africa. You can't do that in Portuguese. So I went there and he found a new tumor. And they said, oh, see, you're multiple myeloma. That's why it's incurable. It's stopped being in your blood. It's in your bones. There's a whole lot of tumors in your bones. So I start again. And again, this time, I, like last time when my, my wife shed many tears and I might have shed one tear, um, she didn't even shed any tears. She just realized, okay, it's another challenge. We've got to go. So we start again. So I've just finished 10 days of radiation. And again, they say, oh, no, you've got to be very tired of that radiation. I was playing with a doctor on Saturday at uh, River Club in Joburg. And he says, what are you doing standing? How can you be standing after 10 days of radiation and, and, and especially on your spine? 
I said, doesn't, I like, guess, yes, my, my heart rate would make me upset. My heart rate was a bit high, but uh, I carried on, you know, and, and you've got to just be, have that mental attitude and to, to beat it. Otherwise, you'll fall down very quickly. It's much easier to go down downhill when you in adversity as well. So you've got to really be even more positive. Sure. You're a special type of person, I think. Um, and lots of people, <laughs> lots of people can, can learn from you and, and, you know, the way you approach things. Uh, another thing that's that's kind of really interesting and stands out is like your self belief, right? You have this like absolute self belief, and you know I think like lots of people do have self belief, you know, and but but there's some point in their life where kind of they they maybe they they stop believing themselves as much, but yours kind of never seems to kind of like dissipate. How, how do you just keep that up all the time? Yeah, actually, I was asked that question um, in New York. I was in, I was on the Hudson River near the trip, and the woman says, "Surely there's sometimes that you feel down, and you think you're not going to make it, or that you feel bad at one stage." And I think, you know, I've never felt that way. And I, and and if I do, I snap out of it very quickly. It must be thirty seconds or forty seconds. I never, ever let myself feel that I'm getting beaten or I'm going down the wrong route or anything like that. I never do. I, I just, if I have that thought, I just change it immediately. And again, you just got to get that gear changed because of course there's going to be these negative thoughts of this is going to happen and this is going to, I never see it. I never see it. And it's funny that my son, exactly, like me, he always sees the bad and everything. I only see the good. I mean, this is a, this is a, just last week he said, Oh, I'm going on this boat. It's a, it's it's owned by a Mexican, but the, all the staff don't know how to speak, and it's a terrible boat there, and this and that. And he gave me all the excuses. I said, okay, well now I'm going to tell you the positive. Number one, you're going to get salary. Number two, you're going to be in Sardinia, beautiful place. Have a look at that. Uh, number three, you're going to learn, uh, and and you're going to gain experience. And and, and if if the people are so bad, you're going to actually rise up the 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 the, the chain to be on top. You see, so that's how you can, you, there's two ways to see everything in life. And I, you must just see the positive way. I just only see the positive way. I couldn't care. And I know I would have, uh, again, that's why I exceed and, and excel because I'm only looking at the positive. I don't look at the negative. The positives can always outweigh the negative. But you know, only people like my son, he looks at the negative. And, and and you can see that that's why he, that, that job he like last of the weeks, oh, this is too bad. I mean, I, there's no way I would have just looked at the boat. Oh, well, I'm getting double the salary that normally it's a shit boat and this and this. You, you can always find negatives and everything, but you've always got to find the positive. And there's always the positive. I don't care what it is. Yep. I'm a hundred percent in your, in your camp there for sure. Um, you know what? Like there's so many things that like, you, like, you know, like for example, um, my wife always says to me, she's like, you always have the no, you know, like, so that's why you must always ask people, like, just ask them whatever it is, like, like, you know, to come on the podcast or to whatever she's like. And, and I always like, I always remember when she said that to me, I was like, yeah, that's such a good way of looking at life. You've always got the no. So flip and just go for, go for broke with everything else, you know? <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So just as we kind of like start to, well, yeah, that's uh, lightning. It's uh, <laughs> or thunder. Um, <laughs> just as we start to kind of finish off here, one of the, one of the things which was pretty like almost crazy, if you ask me, <laughs> that I was really listening to in, in your book was you went to Nazaré, which is this um, place in Portugal which has the most ridiculously huge wave in the world, um, which has become really really well known um, in the last few years. Um, I've, I've been out there and I've, and I've seen it myself and, and it's pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> um, but you went out there on your ski and you were paddling and you now seem to have this goal that you want to ride a hundred foot wave. Like, please just talk me through that. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I've, I've spent my whole life in the ocean and, and I've ridden huge waves all over over the world. I mean, I've done Wabia, uh, Chirpu, uh, Dungeons, uh, you name it, I've been everywhere. And and when I heard about this break, I tried to get a hold of Garrett Malik while he was too busy. So I just went there. And at first, I thought I'd get off the, off the beach. And geez, I couldn't get off the beach. So eventually, I went to the harbor and just paddled out. 
And that day when I paddled out, and I paddled out in the afternoon when it was huge, the waves were about 80 to 90 foot, and, and the, the guy actually broke the record the day I went out there. But I told my wife I wasn't going to catch any waves. I didn't have any safety equipment. I had a life jacket, a Mickey Mouse life jacket, a full wetsuit, had my GoPro, and, and then and my wife said, oh, no, and I told my wife, it's not too big. And then only when you get out there and you saw this little, tiny, little surf ski on this big wave like this, my wife was like, for two hours, it was shattered. And, and that day, I can tell you, it was one of the biggest days they've had because it was breaking like two kilometers out to sea and all over the place. It's a very difficult wave. It's very shifty. But I love challenges like that, and, and, I, and I wanted to do it. So uh, I paddled, and I just checked it out, and I would like, like, like just check it. But I couldn't catch any waves because you'd be, I'd be dead because there's no way I can hold my breath for that long. And then... I just catch the like like play that I was gonna go and then I'm looking back all the time because it's breaking all it shifts all over the place. And then there was an opportunity again. And this time it was smaller, it was probably thirty to fifty foot. So my wife said, Oh, this looks all right. And then once I got out there again, it's like you this and this is big. And then she's suddenly, wow. And there I got a bit more adventures, but again, it didn't have any any uh safety equipment at all. Now, subsequently I've got the fancy rescue uh uh, life jacket which you need uh, as opposed because twiggy baker said no no if you if you can have a proper life jacket rather have a proper life jacket. it's got like two harnesses and it's got a, a steel thing can lift you up if you in trouble with the helicopter so and then i had this this happened to me so i haven't been back again but it's as i say life is a way even you you got to find the right one going the right way and then and if it can be 100 foot it's even better you know because no surfer has done it but uh I still plan to do it, and I've just got to get stronger. So this was a bit of a setback. I've got all these tumors in my bone, but I'm sure I'll, I'll cure that and then keep uh, fighting fit, you know. So the next goal is, in fact, this weekend I'm doing the Breda River Marathon, then in two weeks' time I'm doing the Fish River Marathon, and then at the end of the year, uh, Dragon Run, uh, I'm doing the 20 beaches, then a Dragon Run in Hong Kong, and then at the end of the year there's a World Championship. So And, and now... I might only go for my age group, you know, which is uh, over 60. <laughs> it's time to, time to settle down there, Oscar. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, man. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I really hope that uh, I'm in Portugal um, to root you on uh, when you do get that uh, 100 foot or get out for that 100 foot at least. Uh, so I was just wondering, like, what are you uh, most excited about uh, with the future um, personally or, or business-wise? And um, where can people like get in touch with you and find out about your book? Yeah, I mean, the best way is uh, oscarchilipski.com. That's my website where I've got most of the information on now. It's just uh, re renovated. And, 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 the, and the, the, the whole thing with... with uh, Life is that it seems to be working quite well. My, my company in South Africa, New Mobile is doing very well. Nello is doing very well, getting more and more serve ski sales. So, and, and I'm doing a lot of motivational talks. And I love it because I love teaching people and I love people actually doing, actioning what I'm telling them to do. And they actually, it's something that is, is the best thing for you is when they come back to you and say, you won't believe it, Oscar, since your talk, I've started running. And since your talk, I'm selling more cars or since your talk, I've done. And that's what I love about it because I'm there. Yes, you get a fee, but I don't care about the fee. I'd like people just to improve in my life is about making people better, whether it's through my social media, whether it's through my motivational talks, my goal is to make people better. And, and, and again, I don't think I'm very special, but I think I can uh, impart a bit of knowledge to help make them uh, more special, you know. So that's that's sort of what I want to leave. The legacy of my life is to make everybody just a little bit better than they are. That's super cool. And uh, my last question is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Well, you see, this, this, some people say I could be ridiculously human. In fact, uh, ridiculously human to me means that uh, I heard this strange thing about four or five weeks ago. I said, listen, Oscar, I think you're disabled. I said, maybe I think you are right. He says, yeah, because uh, that 1% of your brain that's supposed to have worry and you haven't got it, so you must be disabled. So that's ridiculously human. When you haven't got that uh, worry part in your brain, then you must be something wrong. You must be a ridiculous human. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Oscar, I just wanted to just quickly say, but um, 
you are such an amazing human and uh yeah i've just enjoyed every single moment of this chat uh, we literally have just touched on so many of the stories <laughs> in your book you know like i was like preparing for this interview i was like yeah, see, what am I going to talk about? There's so much to talk about, you know, it was like very hard <laughs> to kind of pick and choose. And I think we did, we did a pretty good job of, of taking out, uh, taking out many of the good parts, but I really encourage people to go and have a read of your book um, and to, to just also follow you like on social media, because, you know, you're a really positive guy, you put your story out there and it's just really nice, even just sifting through the the comments, you know, to see the support you have. And I think that's a, a good lesson for everyone in life is to, to support each other. Cause I think, I think we really need that in, in these times. Um, but yeah, you just, um, I wish you all the best um, with everything, with the recovery and just keep smiling and being the man you are. So thanks so much for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you, Gareth. And uh, obviously any podcast, the guy who asked the questions the most important, you did a fantastic job and uh, hats off to you because you did your preparation and that's what counts in life. The five P's, which I mentioned there, you know, preparation prevents poor performance and you've done it and well done to you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, buddy. <laughs>